On Friday, the 30th of August, the United Nations General Secretary, Antonio Guterres, attended celebrations for the 25th anniversary of Timor-Leste's independence referendum. Several leaders from Timor-Leste and around the world came together to commemorate a cornerstone moment in the country's history. A solemn ceremony was held on Friday morning to remember the suffering before and after the vote, while in the evening, the people enjoyed a more festive occasion at Dili's Municipal Stadium. Article World News presenter Melva Pereira met with Ian Martin, the UN Special Representative overseeing the historic vote, to talk about his first-hand experiences in 1999 in this exclusive interview. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining RTTL World News. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure. How would you describe the situation when you first arrived in Timor back then? We knew we were arriving in a very difficult situation uh, because uh, since the decision to hold the popular consultation, there had already been a great deal of activity by the militia that the Indonesian army had created. There has been very serious incidents in Likisha, in Dili. We knew that the security conditions ahead for the ballot were probably going to be very difficult. And we also knew we had an enormous challenge because of the short time that we were given. Under the agreement, uh, the Indonesians wanted the ballot to take place on the 8th of August. And uh, it was almost unprecedented for a UN mission to be put on the ground and ready to carry out its task in that period of time. So. When I arrived uh, at the end of May, beginning of June of 1999, we, we knew we had a huge challenge. What were the biggest challenges for you in organizing the referendum in 1999? They were the two I've referred to. One was, if you like, logistical and simply getting the mission set up. I mean, we had to recruit in the end, nearly 1,000 uh, international staff uh, and a very large number of, uh, of national Timorese staff to interpret for us and carry out many other functions uh, and to get people out to the villages to uh, set up the centres where registration of voters would be carried out and eventually the ballot itself. So simply getting the mission set up in a very short time was, was one challenge, but perhaps even greater challenge was security. Um, because under the agreement, uh, there were a lot of people who said that the ballot should only be carried out in the presence of an international blue helmet peacekeeping force. That simply wasn't possible. There's no way, in, in my opinion, and the opinion I think of most other people, no way that President Habibi could have agreed to that. Uh, it would have been so strongly resisted. Um, so uh, it was agreed that security for the ballot would be the responsibility of the Indonesian police. Uh, and they, of course, were completely under the thumb of the, of the TNI, of the Indonesian army. We did have uh, some 200 United Nations police officers unarmed to uh, work with, advise the Indonesian police. And we had some 50 military liaison officers, again unarmed, to communicate with the, the TNI. But security was the responsibility of Indonesia. It promised that it would maintain security. But I'm afraid that promise never really was, was carried out. Uh, our own personnel, but of course even more, the uh, Timorese, especially those who wanted to campaign for independence, uh, were at risk throughout the, the process. And that meant very difficult decisions for us as to whether we should go forward. Uh, should we even open registration when the security conditions didn't exist? Secretary General Kofi Annan decided that we should go ahead at least and begin registration um, then we'd make another judgment halfway through as to whether the conditions were adequate to go on to the ballot and that really was the moment when the courage of the Timorese entered into the picture because despite security they came forward to register in even greater numbers than we had expected and so we went on, completed registration and 
prepared for the ballot itself with ups and downs in security, some attacks on, on Unimet offices, um, uh, and one of my main roles was to continue to try to insist to the Indonesians on the ground here in Timor, they had a task force here, they had senior generals, General Zaki Anwar was the, the most senior of them, uh, but also uh, at one point I went to Jakarta to tell General Ranto himself exactly what we were aware that the TNI were, were, were doing on the, on the ground and President Habibi sent ministers to, to Dili uh, and at some times the situation calmed down a bit and at other times it, it got worse and uh, we were never confident that the 30th of August, the day eventually chosen for the ballot, would really see security conditions and Many Timorese voters had left for the hills but were ready to come down just to vote on, on polling day. And uh, we estimated that nearly 50% of the population who had registered were already queuing up at the voting centres at 6am before they opened on the 30th of August. Tell us about the situation before and after the vote. Well, I've been describing the situation before, a uh, very tense situation. Um, a lot of people who'd been displaced uh, internally, but nonetheless, people were determined to, to, to vote. Then, of course, uh, almost immediately the polls had closed. Um, the first of our local staff who were killed, some 14 Unimet local staff were, were killed. Uh, um, by, by militia. Um, the first were killed after the ballot. Uh, we had a challenge bringing the ballot boxes to Dili to be counted uh, here in, in Dili. But there was kind of an uneasy calm until the result was announced. And on the 4th of September, I announced the, the result. The announce was being announced, the result was being announced by Secretary General Kofi Annan to the United Nations in New York, uh, 9 p.m. in New York, 9 a.m. in Dili, I announced the result at the then Makota Hotel. And then, frankly, all hell broke loose. The, the announcement of the result was the sort of signal for widespread violence carried out by the, the, the militia under the direction of the, of the TNI immediately here in Dili but all around the country with buildings being destroyed, people being displaced, some fleeing to the hills, others being forcibly taken to West Timor. We know from the eventual Truth Commission report roughly how many people were, were killed at, uh, at, at, at that time. Uh, houses were, were destroyed um, and our offices were forced to close down around the country. They were under attack. Um, Again, our local staff were, were the people who were most at risk, but I'm proud to say that our international staff refused to leave Maliana, Likisa, other places, unless they could take the local staff with them. Um, and they, they came to Dili and uh, we all ended up in the Unimet headquarters in, in Dili. Uh, it was extraordinary that no international staff were killed. One American police officer was shot through the stomach as there was firing on the uh, uh, Unimet staff evacuating from the office in Likisha. There were bullets pouring into the office in Baokao, but amazingly no international staff were, were killed. Um, but uh, more of our local staff died at that time. And then we faced the question as to what to do about the safety of everybody who was under siege in effect in the, the UNIMET headquarters. Um, and that wasn't just United Nations staff. Before long, we were joined by 1,500 to 2,000 people who'd been displaced from their homes in Dili, who had been uh, taken refuge in the school next door to, to our compound. Uh, and when there was firing there, they climbed over barbed wire into the Unimet compound, so we became a, a, a camp for internally displaced people as well um, and faced very difficult decisions as to how to get people out as we eventually did to, to Darwin.
Many people say Interfed's arrival in Timor on the 20th of September was too late. What is your view on this? Well, the main violence broke out on the 4th of September. Uh, and that began very strong international pressure, which we fed in terms of our voice from the compound under siege, pressure on President Habibi to invite international assistance, because although Australia in particular was nearby and ready to, to intervene, they weren't going to fight the Indonesian army. They were only going to do that if Indonesia itself uh, accepted a, a, a deployment. And so the pressure mounted. One particular part of that pressure that UNIMET was involved in was a visit by a delegation from the United Nations Security Council uh, who came first to Jakarta but then insisted on coming to Dili. They insisted that President Habibi send General Ranto as well to Dili that day. Uh, and I think it was partly when he saw what had happened, the scale of the, the destruction in Dili, uh, that the TNI ceased to oppose uh, any decision by President Habibi to invite international assistance. So it was on the, 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 14th, uh, the, the, the 14th of September that the United Nations Security Council mandated Interfet um, and the first uh, arrived on the 20th of September, as you said. But actually, I mean, of course, for those of us who were here, that period from the 4th of September to the 20th of September, those were very long days. Um, but actually, that's almost unprecedented in the speed of mobilization of an international intervention with uh, mandating by the Security Council and then the troops being ready to, to come. So. So, yes, of course, we would have been pleased uh, if uh, international assistance had arrived even earlier, but I think it actually has to be seen as, a, as an extraordinary rapid deployment. Of course, that also takes us back to the question, should there have been peacekeepers during the, the popular consultation itself? But as I've said, was politically unrealistic. Um, but, uh, but all credit to Interfet uh, and to Indonesia to, in the end, inviting it and cooperating with it um, to Australia for taking the lead on getting it on the ground so quickly. Uh, you are here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the referendum. What is your view on Timor-Leste's development process in the last two decades? Well, I think this is the eighth time I've returned to, to Timor-Leste uh, since 1999. Um, those have been for happy occasions like this one. I was also here to celebrate the 10th anniversary and the 20th uh, anniversary five years ago, but also at difficult times because I came again as a special envoy for Secretary General Kofi Annan in the crisis of 2006 when buildings were burning in, uh, in Dili um, again. So I've seen uh, Timor-Leste at different stages. I'm really not qualified to assess development overall. I haven't been out of Dili. Of course, I see a lot of uh, new construction in, in, in Dili. But I think the things I would, I would particularly emphasize is that um, Timor-Leste is, I think, rightly referred to these days as the most democratic country in Southeast Asia. Um, you have held elections, uh, overwhelmingly fair elections. Power has passed from one group of politicians to another without any more violence since the, 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 the crisis of, uh, of, of 2006. Um, you have a, 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 a very free press compared to, to, to most countries, um, a very active civil society that, that makes its criticisms. That, that I think, is, uh, uh, is a really important thing. But, of course, I think the biggest challenge for Timor, I mean, each time I come, the population is larger, the population is younger. Um, and how Timor-Leste can provide services health, education, employment uh, for a growing young population is a, is a tremendous challenge and, and of course it's good to have revenue coming from uh, oil and gas in the Timor Sea but that doesn't put many people to, to work so um, I think that's perhaps the biggest challenge that your governments have uh, for, the, for the future. 
You have recently published a book on Timor Leste. Can you talk about it for our viewers? Yes, I'd be delighted to. I, I originally wrote my account, my story of what happened in 1999, and it was published in English a long time ago, uh, uh, in 2001. But when I came here for the uh, 20th anniversary, I th and saw how many young people there are who have no memory of what happened in 1999, I thought I really would like to have my book available in 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 Tetum. And I've had it translated into Tetum and into Bahasa, and uh, now it will be available. And I, I hope people who don't know the story of what happened in 1999 will have the opportunity to learn at least my perspective uh, through this book. Thank you for talking with RTTL World News. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you.